Good afternoon, good evening. My name is Herb, I'm an alcoholic. Welcome to our Big Book 12-step weekly workshop. Welcome to the call. Please recommit to an open mind and an open heart and ask for spiritual intervention to make it so. God, please set aside everything that I think I know about myself, my brokenness, my spiritual path, and you. For an open mind and a new experience of myself, my brokenness, my spiritual path, and especially you. Please join me in the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. But welcome to the call. Today we're going to be taking a look at step 10. As you know, we've spend some time looking at spiritual awakening as phrased in step 12. We didn't look at the entire step 12. Not time to do that. But I wanted to look at that phrase because it specifies the promise and the mission of this process. Spiritual awakening. That's why we're here. That's why we do it. And we unpacked Appendix 2 looking at what it is and how spiritual experience and spiritual awakening are the same and are different. So the, we get a really good handle on the carrot that will be the vision that will draw us through this process if we can remember to look at it. When the time gets tough in the step four, for instance, asking ourselves, well, why are we doing this? Oh yeah, I really want more awakening. Then we looked at step 11 because it's the primary tool of awakening. In fact, look at the mission statement there in the step itself. Sought through prayer and meditation. To improve my conscious contact, to improve my consciousness. That's the mission. That's the purpose of meditation. And as I discussed in length last time, a process of the use of the mind to think and get guidance. Not only guidance, but the power then to implement that guidance. The step 11 ends that way, doesn't it? Praying for knowledge of God's will for me. That's the guidance. And the power to do it. Now tonight, we're going to take a superficial look by my standards at step 10. We'll take a deep dive in it when we get to step 10. But I felt that in the same way, step 11 is one of the tools to navigate this path. Step 10 is the other tool to navigate this path, seeking power through power. A relationship with power in 11 and keeping the channel clear, us, our channel clear of the obstacles to that power. That's the purpose of step 10. The, 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 the step itself tells us it's inventory. Now we know that there are three inventories in the 12 steps. Step four is the mother of all inventories. Some people do it once, step four. Some people do it once a year. Some people do it periodically. There's no right or wrong way, and, the, and Bill doesn't tell us in the big book about the frequency. That's up to you and your path. But he does have two follow-up uh, inventories. He says, we commenced this way of living as we cleaned up the past. We've entered the world of the spirit. And we do inventory during our conscious day. And step 10 in the 12 and 12, really clarifies the use of step 10. 
the tool itself is very clearly described in the big book, but it's not quite clear as it is in the 12 and 12 as to when and how to use it. The 12 and 12 says very bluntly, it's a confrontation actually, if you accept it on face value. It's a spiritual axiom, whenever I'm disturbed, there's something wrong with me. Whenever, whenever I'm disturbed, there's something wrong with me. Now, you may resist that, you may not like that. If you've done some work in step four, you're, you know the truth of it. But be that as it may, that's what Bill says in the 12 and 12. And the word he uses, it's a spot check inventory. Oh, now I understand the use of step 10. It's not a step to be done in writing. It's not a step to be done at night. And you hear it in the rooms because there's a lot of misinterpretation, by my standards anyway, of understanding the steps. When Bill says, it's a spot check inventory. He means on the spot when I'm disturbed, like right now when I'm disturbed. I'm out of alignment with reality. I'm out of alignment with God's will, to put it in different terms. And it disturbs me when I'm out of alignment. Our emotions are signals like a thermostat that tell us when we're in alignment and when we're not. When we're in alignment, we have contentment and joy. When we're out of alignment, we have disturbance and distress. You want to know if you're in harmony with God's will or not, ask yourself, how do you feel today? <laughs> are you in harmony? Are you in contentment? Or are you suffering? And is your life serial suffering? Which means that you're in willfulness, not willingness. You're out of alignment with reality. You're out of alignment with God's will because you're in alignment with your will. Bill suggests at the end of step 11, as we saw, a very, very laser focused, almost perfect prayer. Thy will be done. The prayer of unmanageability and the prayer of the spiritual malady is my will be done. We're, we're not maybe that conscious of it, but our feet show us what our intention is. Our minds uh, are tricky and they lie to us. Our feelings are tricky because they're ephemeral. They come and go, they're cyclical. But our feet, my behavior tells me exactly who I am and what my principles are and what my beliefs are. So in step 10, in the big book, Bill says, watch for the things that he articulated in step four, resentment and fear and dishonesty and selfishness. Those are the four horsemen. We haven't seen it yet in this journey. Some of you have already seen it in, on your own or in other workshops. That unmanageability the second half of the first step is really the spiritual malady. And Bill describes the exact nature of the unmanageability on page 62. Selfishness dash self-centeredness. That is the root of our trouble. Selfishness, self-centeredness dash, excuse me, selfishness dash self-centeredness exclamation point. Not even a complete sentence in the sense that it has no verb but it's a silver bullet to get our attention. Selfishness dash self-centeredness exclamation point. That is the root of our trouble. And of course the fruit of the root, as I will explain when we get to step four, the fruit of the root is resentment and fear and dishonesty as expressed in our sexual behavior. Bill says, watch for these. This is step 10. We've entered the world of the spirit. We've commenced this way of living as we cleaned up the past. I'm quoting. I'm not paraphrasing. I'm quoting from pages 84 and 85. We start step 10 the minute we start step 9. 
we commence this way of living as we clean up the past. I give my people instructions on step 10 when they have finished their step eight and understand the process of step nine. I give them the instructions on step 10. Then I give them the instructions on 11. Then I give them the instructions on 12, the deep instructions. So that they can commence, begin this way of living as we cleaned up the past. As I'm doing step nine, I need access to power. A lot of power because step nine is intimidating. It requires as much power as we can generate. He says, watch for resentment, fear, dishonesty, and selfishness. Then he says, listen, when they crop up, he doesn't say if. All right, we're never going to transcend our humanity. For you perfectionists, that's really good news. Relax. You're never going to be optimal. You're going to be better tomorrow than you are today if you stay gently pressed up against it, and incrementally so every day thereafter. But you're never going to be perfect. It's not a goal. We are material, created, finite beings, corruptible by nature. The minute we're born, we begin to die. It's a hell of a meditation. So he says, when they crop up, what do we do about it? He's got four suggestions. It's a formula. Number one, pray. Hmm. This is a recap of one through nine, step 10. This, he calls it our, one of the tools of our way of life. All three tools are 10, 11, and 12. This is the tool to keep the channel clear. The channel, me, I'm the channel the channel of life, the channel of energy, the channel of God, the channel of grace. How do I keep that channel clear? Through inventory, the roto-rooter to remove the obstacles in the channel. So I pray first because I'm powerless to see it, let alone to eliminate it, whatever that obstacle is. We pray because we're powerless. The second instruction is talk to somebody, replicating the fifth step, of course. Talk to somebody because it takes the power out. It doesn't say talk to your sponsor. In fact, the word sponsor is not in the big book. So just says talk to somebody. It might be your partner. It might be your friend. It might be your co-worker. It might be fill in the blank. Your accountability partner, that's my favorite term. It's not in the big book, but it's my experience. An accountability partner. I had a sponsor, I have a sponsor that is my sounding board for some stuff. I had a step guide who took me through the steps as a project manager, and I have step specialists that I can talk to if I want to use them as a sounding board to get really clear on some aspect of the step work. I have a therapist that I haven't engaged with in probably 15 or 20 years. But back in the early days, the first 15, I had some cyclical and some regular work with that therapist as a supplement to the path. I engaged a spiritual director. I mentioned that person when I talked about unpacking step 11 early on in my recovery, 1989. I engaged a spiritual director to help me understand meditation and he helped crack the code for me. I see him probably twice a year, maybe once every three months if I'm lucky, as needed. But I have a friend, I had a wife, as you know, she died two years ago. Now I have two daughters who are 30 years, one in AA, one in Al Anon. I trust them. I trust them with my emotions. I trust them with my life. I trust them with my soul, like I did my wife. Because they have my best interest at heart, and they're informed wisdom women. My point here is, we each need an accountability partner. Call it whatever you want. 
somebody who we really trust with our soul, that we can be transparently honest with and talk about. Both our successes and our defeats, our assets and our liabilities, it's really important. Not on a daily basis, on an as-needed as basis to be defined by both of you together. So the first is to pray because I'm powerless. The second is to talk to somebody because I'm human. Ah, but the third component of this formula is to make an amend, repair the damage. Well, my logic says if I'm disturbed, my behavior is going to disturb somebody else. I'm going to disturb you when I'm disturbed. That's just the way it works. I pass it on. I'm contagious. We each of us are contagious. Who we are is what we transmit. One of my other teachers says we either transform it or we transmit it. I take it to a different level. Level. We're always transmitting. If we're living in the unmanageability, we're transmitting the bedevilment. If we're living in the spiritual solution, we're transmitting the grace of God. We're always transmitting. Think about that. So the first is to pray because we're powerless. The second is to talk because I'm human. Then the third is to make an amend because when I'm disturbed, I'm going to usually create some type of harm to somebody else. It's not, not all the time. And the fourth and the final and the absolute nail of the bullseye here, if I can mix metaphors, mm -hmm is to turn our thoughts to help somebody else. See, the ultimate solution to the self-centeredness that I talked about as the root of our trouble, the ultimate antidote to self-centeredness is other-centeredness in the healthy sense, not in the codependent sense, but in the healthy sense, to be other-centered. Isn't that what step 11 is? A relationship with other with a capital O? Isn't that what step 12 is? contribution to others with a small o, a spiritual coin, I call it. Step 10 is the coin of emotional sobriety, but step 11 and 12 are the coin of spiritual sobriety. One coin having two sides. And you could, in fact, combine the inventory with meditation as Bill does, in his articulation of meditation in step 11, the nightly review. He said they fit together as hand in glove. But notice what he says, the words are so important in the big book. If we understand literally what he's trying to say, it helps us get some clarity with regard to the step. He doesn't actually say that we help anybody. Read that phrase. When we go over step 10 later on this year, I'll go over it in depth from the big book. I'm choosing not to now just to give you a summary of it and a feel for uh, its use. The step 10 as articulated, described on pages 10, uh, excuse me, uh, 84 and 85 um, are very dense. Each paragraph and each sentence in each paragraph is just really loaded with information and direction. But that fourth recommendation is we resolutely turn our thoughts to helping somebody else. There's no action there. Turning our thoughts. Because Bill probably had a good psychological intuition. The whole book, uh, Law of Attraction, was based on that. How we think is who we are. How we think is how we behave. How we think is what our life will manifest. There's some really good practical psychology in that. I'm not endorsing the book. I'm endorsing the philosophy as I'm just describing it. The book is interesting, but it's a bit too materialistic for me. So he's saying, if I begin thinking, turning my thoughts to helping somebody else, eventually my feet will move in that direction. 
eventually I will do something to help somebody else because I've been thinking about them and not myself. I've been given some freedom and release from my own self-obsession when I begin to think about helping somebody else. And that's the real point. That's the turning that Bill is asking us to commit to in the third step. Listen to it. Made the decision to turn. I'm not going to complete the sentence because that's the real understanding of step three. And we'll do a deep dive in that in a couple of months made a decision to turn our will and our life over to the care of God. Notice the word, over to the care of God. Very much like the GPS when we get in our car. We put in the information as to where we want to go and then we listen to the GPS to receive guidance and direction as to how to get there. It's a phenomenal metaphor for our journey. Reinforcing the benefit and the purpose of meditation. We sit in the presence of power. We really know where we're going, or if we don't, we're asking to give us guidance even on that. But if we know where we're going, that is a spiritual awakening and living by principles and to be helpful to other people, capturing steps 10, 11, and 12. Then we listen to the guidances to the journey and we listen to direction and we take that direction. And to the extent that the channel us is clean and clear of the obstacles, there are no clouds blocking the sunlight of the spirit. To the extent that we are disturbed, there are clouds in us blocking us from the sunlight of the spirit. The darkness is diminished and dispelled through step 10. A mini roto rooter. Step four is the major roto rooter that cleans the channel of the debris of self centeredness, fear, resentment, dishonesty, secrets. Those are the obstacles. It's just human nature. It's not bad or good, it's just human nature. But we can become more optimally human, developing our conscience in step 10, developing our consciousness in step 11, developing our compassion in step 12. So step 10, keep it attached to you like you do your phone. It's a tool. It's always with you when you're conscious and awake. And when you're disturbed, you pause and you implement the tool. You pray, you talk, you amend, and you turn. And if you do that, on a spot check basis, you will be in alignment with reality and your life will flow. And as you practice it, the flow gets more consistent. You establish habits as you practice. Practice step 10. Practice step 11. Practice step 12. Practice. And over time, we get better. Like the dimmer switch goes up a notch at a time and the lights get bright. At the same time, the dimmer switch on a greased axle And it's on a trip trigger to go backwards. Dr. Tebow, who was a psychiatrist that helped Bill Wilson, said, Bill got it right. The first nine steps are for the deflation of the ego at depth. But the ego has an uncanny way of regenerating itself. Brilliant. The ego has an uncanny way of regenerating itself. So here's my image. Look at the screen. Here's my image. I stay gently pressed up against the spirit. And the spirit brings me forward because I'm leaning against the dimmer switch, pushing it up one notch at a time, or at least blocking it from going down one notch at a time. This is my willingness and this is my action. The spirit, that's grace. 
My action, my willingness, pressed up against the dimmer switch of grace, and the lights get brighter. And the word I use for my life, and I have for 30 years, is that it flourishes. My life flourishes. Not without speed bumps. But we have the tools that are the shock absorbers to handle the speed bumps. Step 10 is one of the primary tools. Step 11 is one of the primary tools. Step 12 is one of the primary tools. In all of that, we need direction, teachers and sponsors and step guides and accountability partners. We can't do this living of life by ourselves, and we certainly can't live this spiritual life on our own. Are we human beings seeking a spiritual experience? Or are we spiritual beings seeking a human experience? You may have heard me say it before. After several weeks of meditation on that problem, my answer is yes. I am a human being seeking a spiritual experience, and I am a spiritual being seeking a human experience. It's two sides of one coin. I'm the coin. I have a humanity and a divinity. So um, focus on that assignment in assignment two, which is uh, the uh, first item uh, in terms of what it says to do over the first four weeks. We're going to unpack the Roman numerals from the title page up to the doctor's opinion. And you do it at your own pace. What I've indicated is ask yourself while you're reading it those four questions and then at the end of your reading of that material, write out your answer to those four questions. There's no rush to that. I've, I've emphasized that all along. When we get back together in a couple of weeks, we're going to begin looking at the title page of the big book, the beginning of the Roman numerals, and uh, going through each page fairly carefully to unpack the information as I see it and as you see it on each of those pages. It'll probably take us three to four weeks to do that. So, um, now we're going to um, hear from you with regard to questions, concerns, experiences, resistances. It's all on the table. Because of what you're sharing, I have a question. Um, and the, because you're presenting um, step 11 and then back to step 10, and, and which has been very helpful, um, both of them take us through the same thing. Where am I resentful, selfish, dishonest, afraid? Step 10 is what we do during our waking day. Mm -hmm. Step 11, he says, when we retire at night, we do a review to see if, in fact, we were awake during the day or did we miss something in our step 10? And is there something that we can catch at the end of the day that, will, that needs to be cleaned up tomorrow? So I see it as a seamless whole. Mm -hmm. That in the morning we ask for guidance, then we live our day during that time. If in fact we're disturbed, do we use step 10 at night before we retire? We review our day to see if in fact there's any blip on the radar screen that we missed. Right. But that's, that's just in our mind. It's not in writing. Is that correct? I don't have any investment in whether or not you write or not. It's just not what the big book is not suggesting that you write it. If you find writing helpful, well, then God bless you. Do it. During the day, however, Bill is asking us to use it as an immediate intervention. So sitting down to do writing takes time. And it may not be um, as efficient uh, for the use of step 10 as it's intended to be. That's my only concern there. Nowhere in step 10 and 11 does it say put it in writing. Right. Well, that's great. <laughs> yeah. I like it. Well, I'm glad you did because I think it helped me frame it for everybody else in terms of the big picture of inventory. Mm -hmm. We do step four at the time we're doing the steps, either for the first time or for the next time. And then as we're living our life in 10, 11, and 12, during the day when we're disturbed, we use 10. At night, we see if there's anything else that needs to be cleaned up in 11. In the morning, 
then we plan our day, including cleaning up what we didn't clean up yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank Got you it. so much. Okay, thank you. This step 10 is really where I catch my ego um, throughout the day. And that's kind of what I try to remind myself. And my question to you is, how did you at the beginning remember to catch it? How, how do you catch it quickly so that you don't cause so much damage? Um, that's why we call it a practice. Um, I didn't catch it quickly. But what I did was I went to my boss at work, a guy who I'd had a relationship with that I trusted him. He knew I was in AA and that I somehow was strange that I was like spiritually oriented that was his term you're kind of strange Herb I don't know people that are spiritually oriented I go okay well that's who I am but then I said to him I'm so insensitive that I don't know when I'm being a jerk if you see it or you hear about it in the workplace would you come and to my office close the door because I don't want to be publicly embarrassed but bring it to my attention because I don't want to be that way. And he did. I saw him every like three or four months. He would come in. He said, you're being a jerk again. Yeah, because I asked him to because I don't see it. But over time, as I'm holding myself accountable and getting a little help, it's not his job to tell me that. He, he was willing to help out. My wife, same thing. Mary. If you see that I'm being insensitive with you, certainly, or with our kids or with our friends, I want you to tell me. And she would. My, my, I didn't have to ask my daughters. They volunteered. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But you see, and, and then as I get feedback from people or my sponsor or my companions or my therapist or my spiritual director, um, then I, I begin becoming conscious and I, and, I, and I put it to practice. And so it does require a certain amount of humility okay. to, to go public like that. But I'm so desperate to get the feedback because I'm a, I'm a hardened narcissist back in the day. And I, I don't see it and I don't know it, but I'm willing to be changed. Hear my vocabulary. I'm not only willing to change, I'm willing to be changed by the spirit. Yeah. Okay. What, what about when I usually mistreat myself first? So I know, I know who you are just by the little bit that you've told me. Yes. I, I'm just kind of wondering. You're, you're, I, I, I assume you're in Al-Anon. Uh, no, I should be. <laughs> well, I don't know about should be, but it might be helpful. Right. I guess I just want to know how I catch, like I get my, I, I call it, I've heard it in a book. It's called like an ego story where your ego is telling you a story in your head and it's really not that way. That's it, what we're going to see in the fourth step, the okay. myth and fable of your ego story. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll wait for that. Well, but, but you were going to ask a question. Go ahead. Well, it's just, it's just how to catch that sooner because I feel like sometimes I'll let the ego story go and then I feel very defeated later and it, you know, it hurts me and, Two things that would help you be more conscious. Obviously, the meditation practice will help you be more conscious. Um, but anytime you're inclined to help somebody, if you could pause and ask your motive. Motive is an English word that comes from a Latin word, movere, which means to move. What's actually moving you in the direction of helping somebody? You already have a suspicion because you already said it. There's some kind of uh, manipulation, some kind of a uh, benefit value to you. It's not really clean sometimes. Right. Okay. That'll help you a lot. That pause and ask your motives. Okay. Second, listen to anytime you think think or feel or God forbid say the word should. Hear you yourself say the word should in your mind or in your heart or in your words and, and pause and, and hold the word and ask, is it true I should be helpful? Is it true 
I should extend myself because it's the should that reveals our beliefs, our beliefs about ourselves, our beliefs about other people, our beliefs about how the world works. You're going to get a lot of um, technical support in the fourth step to unpack this at a deep, deep, deep level. But I'm giving you sort of a Reader's Digest version right now to answer your question and to help you begin to become more conscious of, of, that, what's the, of the unconscious. Thank you. So this week has been totally transforming once again. It's just in layers of how, how things are happening. And just tonight, when you were talking about this 10th step, because it goes right into an experience I just had with the 10th step. I've been taking 10th steps now since November from people and, get, and doing 10th steps and always had these powerful experiences. And so when I was feeling disturbed, I would reach out for people to call me for 10 steps. So I had a very, very horrible experience with a person doing their 10th step. And when I got off the phone, then I had to do a 10 step <laughs> over the way I'd just been treated. But what I saw in doing that was my selfish motive of taking 10 steps. I was doing it to feel better. And but then that's, I, but, but that's, that's the motive of an addict, isn't it? What can I do to feel better? Better. And, and that is the potential difficulty some people have with meditation is in the beginning, there usually is sort of a pink cloud with a new experience with meditation and people like to feel that pink cloud. And then when it goes away, they chase it in meditation because that's what they wanted from meditation is to feel good. But that's not the purpose of meditation. It is a potential byproduct, but it's not the purpose. The purpose is right in step 11, as you just said, to have an improved consciousness, an improved relationship with God as we don't understand it. Yeah. But thank you so much. And even this one, when you talked about turn your thoughts to help someone, that doesn't mean jump up and pick up the phone again. <laughs> what that means is turn your thoughts and then wait, pause. So it's the pause that gets me in trouble all the time. I'm just going to barrel ahead. Well, about 25 years ago, I had the insight to stop initiating spiritual work because the motive was to look spiritual. But what I do now is I wait for an invitation. And then I evaluate it whether or not it's something I'm literally being called to do by God. And if I get the invitation and my sponsor and I agree that it's something that I should respond to, then I do. But I have to be constantly careful of this wily ego of mine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much, Herb. It sounded to me like you said something, and maybe I'll paraphrase that a sense of humor is a good thing. Well, well in fact, that was the implication what he said to me is, it's the sign of authentic spirituality. A true sense of humor is a sign of authentic spirituality. Because you're, especially if it's about yourself, because you're not taking okay. yourself seriously. Go ahead. Uh, okay. So I've been using humor uh, for quite some time. And sometimes I wonder if I've uh, distorted it in some way or if it's become something that I use to cover up something that's probably true about me that I don't want to uh, fess up to or something like that. So I guess um, in, in the same way I asked somebody else, check out your motives. What's your motive for the humor? Is it in fact to bring joy to people or is it to bring attention to yourself? al have a great way of approaching it. It is... Um, is what I'm going to say true? Is what I'm going to say necessary? Is what I'm going to say timely? And I and am I the one to say it? Okay. And with those kind of questions, we really minimize its uh, its 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 ego origins. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and another one I would add: Is it going to be helpful? 
That's my uh -huh. favorite lens through which I look. Is what I'm about to say going to be helpful? Okay. And I adopted that in my communication with my wife at about, oh, 10 years of sobriety. About half of my conversation with her went away. Because oh. it, my, 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 mine were not helpful. They were criti critical or passive aggressive or some other kind of manipulation. Yeah, hi. Um, I've got a question regarding meditation. I did your um, your workshop last year as a listener, and I was trying the whole year to figure out how to listen to the, or how to find a quiet voice inside myself. And I struggled to discern it from my voice. I didn't hear, or I don't hear any um difference or if, if there's a voice I start to doubt it if it's coming from me or not do you have any suggestions how yes. to approach it yeah. Yeah. Uh, drop the word voice I may have mentioned but it's worth mentioning again in the context of your question I went back to look at the original translation from the Aramaic I don't translate from Aramaic, but somebody else did in that scripture passage, we small voice. And that's a bad translation, we small voice. The actual translation is tiny whispering sound. So what is the sound that you're listening to? The sound of the words in your mind the sound of the feelings in your heart, the sound of the instincts in your gut. And we're listening to what is the energy, the, the, the whisper in us, kind of an intuition that's coming. Mostly from our, we can be aware of our thoughts. See, the thoughts are not the voice, but they have some sense of uh, vibration, our thoughts. Um, and you heard it, somebody early on talked about uh, getting some guidance from their thoughts that way. So I've never heard the voice here, the words here, the guidance here audibly, but I've heard the suggestions very subtly as I interpret my thoughts and my feelings and my gut instincts. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and what, what do I do if my doubts come up that it's my, you know, the, the thoughts are coming from my ego? And that's where the fourth step is so valuable because in the fourth step, we really unpack all the technical or manifestations of our ego so that we're more easily able to identify it. If you haven't done a fourth step, it's going to be more difficult, but there's where sponsorship comes in. So if I have mm -hmm. a real mm, question about whether it's ego or God, I go to my sponsor and I discuss it in, in, as a sounding board. So when do you listen to the, to the sound? The, to the small, really small sound, and when am I listening to my thoughts? I, my translation is there is there, that's a synonym. The sound and my thoughts are a synonym. Okay. They're the same thing. Okay. So it's just different for every person. Some people have listened to their thoughts, and some people listen to to a feeling. I'll bet yeah. you that's true. I'll bet you that I'm more thoughtful than I am feelingful, but I'll bet you that's true. There are people who are much more guided by their feelings than their thoughts. I bet you that's true. I hadn't thought of it, but I think that's right. Yes. At the same time, there are people who are much more gut oriented in terms of instincts, and those might be mm -hmm. more dominant than thoughts and feelings. Yes, that's very good insight. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Very, very good questions. That's why we need to say the set aside prayer, right? So that we can um, be open to something new. And then as we practice, 
we build the trust that what's coming to us is from God and it's not from our higher power and not from my ego. And, and we have to put that almost like a faith in, in that practice that it's going to happen. Like I'm, my, my higher power is going to be bigger than my ego. And so over time, if I'm discerning, I was just thinking the set aside prayer should help that out. And number two, the, as we build the trust, that should help too, right? Am I right on that or what do you think? 100%. The practice okay. leads to trust and confidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what Bill wraps up the instructions um, in, in pages 85 to 88. He said, over time, we get better at it and it's more reliable, right? Yeah. I don't trust myself. And I think that's what, like, not. And, that, and, and in the made. beginning, it's, appro it's appropriate. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. <laughs> I'm an addict, right? <laughs> so thanks. Well, an addict as well as a self-centered human being. Yes. And I don't even know how self-centered I am, um, literally, for 10 years in, in recovery. I did the steps in 88. I did them again in 91. I did them again in 94. It was 94 that began to reveal to me that narcissism what I want to ask is, there are days that I feel really centered and in harmony and I'm walking and, you know, I'm just the blade of grass and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm moving and things happen naturally. And then all of a sudden, I'll stick my foot in my mouth and I'll say something stupid or unnecessary or I'll hurt someone's feelings. And, and am I the one to say it? That comes up a lot. Am I the one to say it? But does it get easier further down the road? Or do those things just happen where we're, we make mistakes? Or well, we certainly do make mistakes, but we make them less frequently and less atrociously. So okay. rather than 30 pound salmon, we start making mistakes at the one pound trout and then we start making, then we graduate down to minnows. So I'm, I'm definitely still, you know, having hiccups in terms of insensitivity and a lack of consideration or a lack of balance, but it's not like very visible and it's not very often. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Hit. Once again, think the dimmer switch. As the dimmer switch goes up a notch at a time, and it only goes up if we push it forward, but it goes up a notch at a time, there's more light. Now, the good news is there's more light, so we see more. But the okay. potential bad news is there's more light, and we see more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> definition of a religion is a system of belief practice and ritual oriented towards a higher being so what i see as the the distinction in the spirituality that the 12 steps offer is that all religions might be a portal to the spirituality but they themselves are not this they are not it so um to say that God is in the church, is in my church, would be kind of like a narrowing definition of a higher power. So I would just, uh, I would just make this comment. If you say it this way, God is only in my church. Right. Then, in fact, you've uh, slipped off the rails and you've become a cult and you've become delusional. But... To say God is in church, that's wonderful. Why not? Because the big book suggests in chapter four, God is everywhere. Right. God is or God isn't. God is everything or God is nothing. So with that in mind, I was thinking about the word anonymous and um, from the Greek meaning name, but in a, in a definition I found, it said lacking individuality and 
I'm, I'm wanting to understand the correlation of the name with the step work that we're doing because we're going towards something that's named for us and step 11 and 12 from what I understand you saying is really a broadening of our purpose beyond ourselves. It's very communicable, which fits with that idea of unitive and communicative. So how does anonymous work with that? You're um, going to have a very big experience if you continue with your questions and your search of words and your thinking through of relationships. I'm so excited for you, uh, really, because what, what you've indicated, and I'm going to address both of those, um, I, I hope, in a, in a way that will be very practical. Let's take the last one first, okay. and that is uh, anonymous. As you say, it comes from the Greek meaning no name, and Bill uses the term formally in tradition 11 and 12, and he calls it anonymity is a spiritual principle, all right? There is no... There's no difference. In other words, we're not unique as human beings. We're unique as individuals, but we're not unique as, as human beings. And in the fellowship, there is no special person. All right, we're all the same. So think in terms of, I don't know where you live, but I live here in Southern California. We have very vast beaches. Think of the beach and the, and the grains of sand. Every grain of sand is absolutely unique in itself, mm -hmm. uh, physically. But when you look at it, you see all you see is the beach. There's no distinguishing difference between one grain of sand and another. That's the spiritual principle of anonymity in the fellowship. No one up, no one down, no one different better, no one different worse. We're all the same, all right, human beings. So then let's go to religion and spirituality. And you hear it so many times, I'm a spiritual, I'm not religious. And it's wonderful, all right? And I hope people understand what they're, what they're saying when they say it. Because it's deep wisdom. Religion is the portal. I love that term. I hadn't used it because I'm not a technically oriented person, but I will now begin to use it. Religion is the portal to spirituality. Yes. And, and the, mm, the way I was first introduced to it was in my study of Buddhism, where the teacher, the Buddhist teacher, stands on the path. I hope you can see my arm pointing. Yes. The Buddhist teacher stands on the path pointing with the finger out pointed, the finger out pointed to the light. The light is the relationship of spirituality. Unfortunately, many of the students begin worshiping the finger. That's religion. AA is quite capable of, be, of deteriorating into a religion, especially in certain different meetings, where there's a cult of personality or a cult of protocol. I don't worship the book, and I don't worship the steps, and I don't worship AA. I hold them in high regard. But the steps and meetings and the fellowship and the book are, have only one intention. They're all instruments or portals to a spiritual awakening, a relationship with the light. So I have a resistance to identifying myself even though I am a food addict, I will accept that identity. But I, I have a resistance to talking about my quote unquote program, the program I work. Well, tell me what you think you mean by program. Okay, so I see the program as a framework, a structure, the rules. There are no rules, but go ahead. The suggestions. Yes, the suggestions. So it's the format that's undertaken. And what I'm seeing for myself is I need to be in and amongst the support of fellow food addicts to help me. Tell me about your resistance. What's your resistance to the term program? 
my resistance is based on people in my recovery program look at don't talk about the steps they talk about their sponsors they talk about doing the tools and i have a different focus i have trouble identifying it as my program which keeps me abstinent it's my relationship with my higher power that does that's exactly right and it's not subtle it sounds subtle until you understand it experientially like you do but does it matter what their terminology they're using as long as you're using the vocabulary that you want and you understand so i do agree program are the tools program are the protocols in fact from my standpoint very crisply the program of recovery in contrast to the program of living the program of recovery are steps one through nine that is the program that is the protocol that is the portal that is the ingredients those are the suggestions that will bring you to recovery meaning freedom from your addiction first half of the first step then that's the program of recovery steps one through nine the program excuse me uh, the way of life as bill calls it are 10 11 and 12 which is the program of living dealing with unmanageability the second of the first step but connected to your concern and resistance to the word program okay um uh, i think program can be like a religion that can hold you kind of hold you and bind you to the its tenets i want to be able to relate with someone who's going to sponsor me to understand the steps really well. Not that would be helpful. <laughs> not the not the tools of recovery in a program, right? Well, so all right, but but here's where here's where in, in step 10 Bill says love and tolerance are our code. It doesn't say uh, evaluation and judgment. Love and tolerance are our code. And so in AA, there are many people, I'm, I'm, I'm sad to report, many people who think that meetings are the program. Meetings are not even mentioned in the big book except a couple throwaway lines. We meet weekly so that newcomers can bring their problems and we meet periodically in people's homes for the fellowship that we crave. I believe those are the only two lines in pages one to 164 that reference meetings. Meetings are not even a tool mentioned in the big book as part of AA. It's developed as a culture over time and I'm very supportive of meetings. I went to a meeting every day for 10 years and I still go to meetings even on Zoom once or twice a week. Mm -hmm. But meetings are not the program. They're just an environment for the fellowship to support the program. Right. The word sponsor is not in the big book. You may or may not know that. Okay. The word sponsor is not in the Roman numerals nor the pages 1 to 164. That word is not used. It didn't come into the fellowship until after the book was published in the 12 and 12, which was published in 1951. It, it, it's it's all through the, each of the chapters, the term sponsor. So in those 12 years, the term sponsor came in. Now, again, I think the most important moving part in the program of recovery is sponsorship because we need teachers and we need accountability partners. If you have an ex a, 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 a consistent, effective relationship with an experienced person, I'm, I'm modifying it. If you have a effective relationship with an experienced person you will do all the other moving parts of the program all right so that's why i think today that sponsorship is the most important part um, the tools are just part of the vocabulary that have been developed i'm very familiar with the environment and with the, this conversation i've had it many times 
you need to find somebody who is an experienced person who can help you, who resonates with you and you with them, and that they have a flexibility to allow you not to accept some of the terminology. That's really the critical part because okay. it, could, it could get in the way of their helping you do what you've said. The, the fellowship itself and your sponsor has been one and the tools have been wonderfully helpful to you to accomplish what it is you're there for anyway. But people get cultish about some of the vocabulary and some of the program and some of the tools and they begin worshiping the finger and that's never healthy. But it's not my job to convert them and to teach them and to bring them out of their darkness. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wonderful conversation. As I say, buckle up, shoulder straps, because you're in for a real journey. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. I've been taught uh, when I do a 10th step to do a mini fourth step, you know, to actually look at the selfishness, the dishonesty, the self-seeking and the fear, and um, what, it, what my issue affects. But the second paragraph on page 75 is what she pointed out to me, um, that we also go into the in essence, the fifth step, follow up to the fourth step when we do a, a tenth. We pocket our pride and go to it, illuminating every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past. Once we have taken this step with holding nothing, we are delighted. <laughs> we can look the world in the eye. We can be alone at perfect peace and ease. Our fears fall from us. We begin to feel the nearness of our creator, creator etc. Those are the promises of step five on page 75. Yeah. They make a wonderful meditation, by the way, but go ahead. So I'm, I'm not sure where you're going with this, but it's interesting. So she said, all right, we've, we've done the 10th step to this period, to this point. Are you delighted? I said, no, I'm not delighted. I don't feel at peace. I don't feel resolved. And so the next thing she said to me was, something on this order. Um, have you, you know, another thing we have to touch is, have you been inconsiderate? And I said, well, what, what do you mean? She said, well, have you considered? What have you considered? And I said, well, I considered um, talking with the person about it openly. I considered doing a 10th step. I, all these things that I considered, I did. And she said, well, there's one thing you're missing. And she said, have you considered that this is a gift from God to you to bring this up out of the basement for you to look at and have a new experience with? And by the time we were done, I was delighted. So I consider the disturbed part, actually, the invitation i'm being invited to look at something from the seller yeah. and i use that term invitation it's not in the big book but in line with what you were talking about mm -hmm. in, in terms of reframing it as a positive thing it's not a bad yeah. thing mm -hmm. it's not a bad thing that i feel disturbed mm -hmm. it's really a good thing that i'm aware that i feel disturbed yep. because there's something amiss in me and now I know I can go to the doctor and, and have it treated with the medication of meditation, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or service to other people. So, and if people want to hear more about the 10-step practice or the deep unpacking of the big book, pages 84 and 85, you could go to my website and listen to one of two or one of three recordings. I'm not sure exactly how many there are. Um, where I would have then done the teaching as well as had the dialogue about it, which you will all experience sometime uh, toward the end of our, our time together, right around the 10th month, actually. Thank you. And I am using meditation in the morning and at night, and I just thought I'd try to, it's a lot very similar to how I've done it before, though I'm trying to be more intentional about it. I just want to talk about the word thinking for a second, you know, allowing myself to think. What do yep. you do with the thoughts when they come? If you're there, the Scott, the thoughts that are. Um... Well, uh, let me back up a little bit. Given 
you brought up the question about med- what is meditation for you? What is it and what's its purpose? Um, quieting my mind. But then you gave me permission to think. It's not quieting your mind. It's actually stimulating your mind. It's the opposite of quieting the mind. Unless well, you I'm mean by unless you mean disturbances. Unless yeah, that's it. Unless you mean that's by I mean. calming it, calming it. Yes. But the whole point of meditation is to think and then listen to and watch and understand your thinking as a message. But if I'm sitting there and I remember that I've got to go someplace right after this and my tank is empty, so I need to allow myself to have time to get gas, that's something I might want to make a note of and not just send down the river. See what I mean? Yeah. But, if it's a, but if it's an idea like, gosh, I wonder what I'm going to be like um, Sunday at the party. Yeah, that's like a distraction. All right. And so then that's the one that I would attempt to, in whatever ritualistic way you want, to let go of if you put it in a box and send it down the river. That, that's fine in terms of whatever poetic approach that you need for it, to, to, to just let it go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I appreciate that. And I just, I wanted to verify that I understood that. And then after, in the book, after the meditation comes the contemplation. Can you talk more about that piece? Yes, I can actually. (laughs) Again, um, meditation is the use of my mind to think. Contemplation is the use of my will to consent an act of love in the presence of the presence that I'm open to being transformed. Mm. Thinking is about being informed. Meditation is about being informed. Contemplation is about being transformed. Now, uh, those are artificial distinctions because meditation will transform you too. But it, I love, I love the, mm, the, 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 the sound of the words because it, provides such a distinction that gets people's attention. The reason I'm doing meditation is guidance or information. The reason I'm doing contemplation is change, metamorphosis. In the presence of the presence of the power, I'm going to be absorbed by the power and I am going to absorb the power. It's almost like a symbiotic relationship. So that's why it comes after to... So, you know, I do the meditation, I'm looking for the information and the guidance. And then when I go into the contemplation, it's like, can I, I'm asking if this is what you said, I'm taking what I've heard to then see if it, how I can embrace it to well, transform. That would, be just, that would be part of the, that would be part of the meditation. Mm. If in fact you're thinking about how to implement the guidance that you got, that's the tail end of the meditation. And by the way, don't, let's not be arbitrary about the order of things. I, mm-hmm. My order is I pray and then I meditate and then I go into my contemplative stance. And if I were to allocate time, it would be two or three minutes in prayer, five minutes in meditation and 20 minutes in contemplation. But what, what happens practically, I start perhaps even in contemplation. I'm just completely overwhelmed this morning with the awe of the presence of God. And I sit there, quiet, receptive, not thinking, but aware of that presence and the magnificence of the energy. And then I might kind of drift into some type of prayer, maybe the third step prayer as a moment of recommitment. And then I might go, well, I better think about my day to make sure that um, I've got things in balance. And then I might go back into my contemplative stance. But I'm, I'm hoping you're hearing the flexibility of this. It's not about A, B, C, one, two, three. Please do not use formula when it comes to your spirituality. Mm-hmm. Keep it really all-inclusive and, 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 and wear it like a loose garment, to quote scripture. Yeah? Yes, thank you. Because I just I feel better understanding the the information versus the transformation. I think that's helping me. Absolutely, and and I think that 
the questions that you asked are wonderful that we get a chance to explore it a little bit more, maybe different words that I'm using so that other people can also benefit from it. And, but let's be really practical. What is it all about? As one of the, the people talked about earlier, it's a med prayer and meditation and contemplation. The total purpose of that is a portal. Those are portals to a relationship with God. Prayer is when I'm talking to God. Meditation is when I'm listening to God. And contemplation is when I'm being in the presence of God, absorbing it. Mm. Yeah, nice. I still have blocks about my inability to feel God, God's love, and a very low self-esteem. And I, I suffer from not being enough. Um, and would it be your opinion that if I, um, I have this hope that with regular meditation and continuing in this um, year program, um, that maybe some of those blocks could be unlocked. I'm very... Inevitably. Inevitably. And even if you'd work the steps out of the big book, on your uh, with with people and whatever else you've done and had spiritual awakenings, coming to them again will broaden and deepen your experience. I can't predict what will happen, other than there there is additional change that's available to you. Yes. Thank yes. You. Yes. Yeah. Well, and the one thing that. I, I, you'll hear me stress regularly is when people start talking about feelings. Feelings are incredibly important, like we talked in step 10. Feeling disturbed is a signal, a thermostat for us that something's amiss. It's really important that we have feelings and that we pay attention to them. Feelings tell us if this is a source of suffering. Feelings tell us if this is a source of joy. It's absolutely critical for our survival and our happiness that we listen to our feelings. However, when we bring it into the spiritual life, it has a potential trap because we're, feelings are biochemical. Feelings are cyclical. And when people are chasing a feeling of God or a feeling of God's presence, after they've actually had a feeling of God and God's presence because of whatever reason, then, in fact, they will shut themselves off from it. If they chase that feeling, they will chase it away. It's being into it, embracing it, leaning into it, enjoying it, but not having it the determining force of the purpose of meditation or prayer or even of our spiritual life. Tell me your reaction to those thoughts. Yes, you can't chase it. You just have to... Lean into it. Yes. Thank you. That's it. That, that's my term is lean into it because there's a gentleness there. There's not a, there's not a major effort. There's no violence at all. We just lean into the spirit. And my experience now, to continue with that metaphor, I lean into the spirit and the spirit wraps its arms around me and leads me forward. Now, I don't feel that. I don't know that. But when I stop three months later and I look back over my shoulder, I go, you know, somebody hitched up my trailer. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Way of Life document about the prayer time and, and meditation time. And um, I have gone from being uh, wondering, and I set a timer, and I've been wondering about, I'd gone from wondering about if I was. Um, how long have I been here and this and that to actually having the timer, which I set for 20 minutes this morning, interrupt me. It's like I could go longer. I will. And so it's just been. Don't, don't go longer unless you intended it, because at some point as addicts, we begin uh, then ch continuing to think that more is better. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Well, I'm, I'm not making any rules or anything. I'm just sort of challenge yourself. Yeah, it yeah. may be, it may be when the timer goes off and you do have additional time that you're in such a place 
that you feel invited for another 10 or 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Honor that and stay with it. But be careful about our inclination toward compulsivity. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I needed that reminder. Uh, well, we all do. Yeah. And also, um, I was thinking about the question that was raised last night about when you're listening to whether you call it the wee small voice or those uh, whisper, what, uh, how do you know whether it's your, how would I know whether it's ego or whether it's the, my higher power? And what I've come to so far that I wanted to share was that when I have a thought or thoughts that in no way would I think on my own, then I say, aha, that's, that's not me thinking it. That's not my ego. That's not my agenda. This is my higher power. It's, 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 it comes from a place that I wouldn't know how to go to on my own. Well, um, you know, the, it's the classic question. If you're awake and wanting to begin to practice meditation and beginning to have, or even long-term practitioners, how do I discern between my ego mm -hmm. and, and God's invitation? Mm -hmm. um, there's no formula. Again, it's kind of like common sense as well as relying on perhaps a sponsor sounding board relationship. But there's a couple of things. Check your motive. What's the motive underneath whatever the suggestion is? Mm -hmm. And, and so a lot of times then we can determine that the motive is ego-centered or it's about improving my spiritual life and or helping another person. And that's really the key here. Does it bring joy to me or somebody else? And especially, is it helpful to somebody? So those are kind of the criteria of whether it's coming from my ego or coming from God. Thank you very much. Great questions. Thank you so Thank much. You. Good. He asked me what the fourth step said at that point. And I said that it said, we take a searching and thorough moral inventory. And he told me, no, it didn't. And I was crushed because I don't like to be wrong. And I'd already been wrong. And he said, Karen, it says fearless. And he said, this is a gentle program. He said, God doesn't want us to feel fear. Um, and it was profound to me. He said, fear is a fire alarm. And he said, when you feel fear, you are done with the fourth step for that moment. And he said, I have really good news for you. You just did your fifth step why you did your four step because you told God and I about it. So, and then he said a really nice thing. He took me back to kindergarten and he said, good job. You got an A plus, you got a gold star. And then I felt better about having been wrong. And then I got up to leave and he said, never, ever, ever do a four step with someone without immediately doing a fifth. And you just did a fifth. And then I thought we were really done. And he, um, he told me, absolutely to never allow anybody to do a fifth step without gently taking them through the sixth and seventh. And I'd done the program probably five times by then, and I didn't even know what the sixth and seventh were. I'd missed them. And it was my first experience with having unmanageability and being given permission to turn it over to God. Uh, I'd never, ever done that before. And I'm getting, um, you know, I, I'm going to die still not being great at it, but I keep getting better. But that fearless thing really worked for me that I didn't, because fear, it's tough. My number one fear in life is active addiction. And uh, I did my steps. The last time I did them with you, I did, that was one of the things I did my four step on was active addiction. And um, I can't believe the miracles that God is bringing me in my six step. And I'm really excited about doing the steps this time because I think that when I do them with you this time, I might even be able to come close to doing it fearlessly. I also love everything you said about prayer, meditation, contemplation, and 
you can repeat it as many times as you want because it's always like brand new every time you say it to me. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you for everything. Thanks, yeah. Does listening to our last Zoom meeting, not this one, but like yesterday's, does that count as the same? Or do you want us to specifically go back to an old recording? That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, um, if you're on the workshop yesterday, Mm-hmm. Why would you want to re-listen to it? Because it was so good. <laughs> well, there you go. So then you make up your mind as to whether there's a benefit to you. Some people will want to re-listen to it because it was dense and they didn't catch it all and they get an opportunity to re-listen to the same thing. Other people yeah. will go to the recordings on the website because they want to hear it from a different setting so that they can hear it differently. Mm. That's all. So I don't have any rules about this. Um, Mm. I I know that I put in the the assignment document that it's required. I believe at the beginning, though, of our workshop together in the orientation, I said I'm verbally modifying that to strongly suggest it. I have no Mm. requirements. And... Mm. Because the, the 12-step fellowship is like that. There are no requirements. Mm. There's no requirements. There's no rules. Mm. There's no regulations. There's just, as we talked about in the beginning, there's only suggestions. So, mm. yeah. So, what you determine what will be helpful to you. Mm. Many people have found it very helpful to listen to the recordings on the website as a support to what we're hearing here. If you find it more important and more helpful to re-listen to what was said here, this is the current information. This is my current interpretation. This is my current experience. On the website, that's probably information and experience from seven or eight years ago. 85, 90% of which will be totally relevant, still is my knowledge and my experience. But there's been a shift of maybe 10 or 15% in the way I present it or the vocabulary that I use. Mm. And, and one other thing, um, I'm overwhelmed with the, um, uh, the depth of everybody's shares and their knowledge and um, spirituality to the point where, and I hope this doesn't sound egocentric, but I feel like I don't... Not that I don't belong, because I, I am here to learn. And, and where do you start? Are you, are you in a 12-step program? Yes, but it's well, not very rich. Well, wait, 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 wait. Why did you hesitate just then? <laughs> are you in a 12-step program? I am. I'm in a couple. There you go. And are you relatively new then to the 12-step rooms? It, yes. Okay, so you're you're at the beginning of your journey. Some of these people have been around for 10 and 20 years. Some of these people have done this workshop two and three times. They're going to sound a lot smarter than you are. Absolutely. They do. It's just amazing. I mean, some of the people, I could listen to them as a workshop themselves. That's right. Just the question, the art, everything. That's right. I'm just in shock. I'm actually teary. I'm so moved. And I, I said a few weeks ago, after this, I, like, I can't really do anything. Like, I don't want to talk to other people or do outreach calls or, because I'm so filled with this stuff and it's magnitude. Some people That's have said his- that the workshops ruin meetings for them. Exactly. That- <laughs> That's exactly right. And that's why they come to the workshop for a meeting rather than doing the work again. That's exactly right. Because here we are, vulnerable and, and of substance. Oh, you got it. That's You're right the on the money. That's the word. I'm just like overwhelmed with the substance. Just. So my, one, my mantra for you. Yes, I'm writing. I have that. only one word. Breathe. Ooh. You okay. just show up and breathe. Okay. You'll be fine. Okay. Yep. Herb says, all I have to do is show up and breathe. Perfect. I'm good. All right. Thank you. All right.
would you assume that most often the the thinking part the guided thinking of asking god what's your knowledge of your will and how, what do you want me to do today who do you want me to be today is, is that always more of a five minute beginning followed by the 15 minutes and or should i not worry about being too structured Please don't worry about being too structured, but my answer would be yes to you. That's how my practice is. I begin with prayer just to open myself up and establish the relationship. I also repeat step 11 itself to remind me of its purpose to improve my conscious contact. That's the, the total reason I'm sitting here. Then I do my meditation and it's usually five or 10 minutes. It might be less than five minutes, whatever. I don't time it. And then I move into intentionally, I move into the centering prayer contemplative practice, attempting not to dilute it with prayer and meditation, but knowing that that's not under my control, that I just am attempting to be in the centering prayer mode and whatever happens, happens. So let me ask you this, would you be able to, do you do, for instance, I'd been trained that you do a sacred word and sometimes I would doing, do like... No, no, wait, 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 wait. You're, you're making too much of the sacred word in your vocabulary here, uh, at least from my... Let me ask this question. What is the purpose of the sacred word? To train my brain to focus on that spiritual moment with God, I think. Okay. I mean, all right, all right. In a way, in a way, yeah, I can hear that. The way I would phrase it, answering that question, what is the purpose of the sacred word? It is a symbol of my acknowledgement of the presence and my consent to it having its way with me. It's a symbol. So in the sense of the training, I do agree that when I find that I am distracted, I invoke the sacred word as a mechanism to put up some handrails to remind me that I'm here to be aware of the presence of God and consent to that presence only. And I repeat the mantra as the symbol of that, the sacred word as the symbol of that, until in fact I'm fully restored to that moment of awareness. And then I release the word. I do not continue saying the word. Is that okay. uh, similar to what you do? Um, I don't think I'm there yet. I'd like to say I was. I, um, I have been there before. Uh, Where's there? But Where's there? What, what, what do you think me, I that, just said? Where's the, there? The, the, a moment of just being so connected in the present with presence with God. It's a calm, serene feeling, very peaceful, very spiritual. Maybe, uh, Maybe not. Um, have you read Thomas Book's Open Mind, Open Heart? No. Read it. Okay. Yep. That's his primer. That's his basic orientation. Read that book. And then if you care to read the first chapter in my book, the new one, Practicing the Here and Now, and you'll, you'll, you'll read Thomas's book and he'll give you a huge grounding in the vocabulary of centering prayer and the practice. And then read mine, which will give you the big overview of all of intentional consciousness. And I think it'll be very helpful because you, you're on it. You, you, First of all, you don't have to do anything except continue with your practice, and you'll be just fine. But I, I get a sense that you want to also understand the vocabulary and, and the methodology so that you can, in fact, embrace them more effectively. Correct. And I yeah. do have the issue of wanting to do it right to get the most oh, yeah. effective. No, no, I heard that. I heard that. That, <laughs> that was so clear with the way you uh, used the word sacred, sacred word. You were using it as a hammer on an anvil. Yes. Well, I appreciate the suggestion. Thank you. And very yeah, excited welcome. to be here. Oh, you're, 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 you're in such good shape with the energy that you have and the exposure that you have. Just continue gently pursuing, getting some more information, getting exposed to these teachers like Thomas Keating. And um, you're, you know, this time next year, you'll have a much better conversation. You've committed to the work and committed to helping other people with the work being a step guide. That's wonderful. The definition I use for rigorous honesty is transparent. Mm -hmm. I want to be transparent. I want my insides and my outsides to match. 
transparent in an appropriate way, obviously. There are need to know kind of situations. You don't just, you know, bleed out every place you are. So it's about, but I love the word transparent because again, it takes away from any type of perfectionism in the sense of the rigorous. That, that word can be a hammer also. I just want to say that um, when you were talking about feelings and feelings are a source of uh, how we can judge ourselves and, uh, or know what's going on with ourselves. I found out over this last couple years that I can make myself feel badly about something because of what I'm telling myself. So I had a, re it, it seems like I have to reframe so much. The word, That's, you just read my mind. That's exactly the word. Basically what I'm saying is I have you had to use different, pro our program, the 12 step program in different areas to learn to accept myself and to embrace my own individual my own individual journey i have tried my whole life trying to be something that i liked out there that's human nature by the way but it's on steroids when we're addicts it's a dvd that was recorded with dr berger who's a clinical psychologist and myself talking about uh, emotional sobriety, I'm really encouraging you to spend the time to watch it and listen to it. I think it will be very helpful right in the area that you're talking about. What a, what a perfect way to end our call today with uh, a, a shout out for that. And God's not absent. Notice the words of step 11. Improve our conscious contact, meaning we establish the conscious contact in step three, and we confirm the constant contact in step two. More about that when we get to it. But Bill had an organic sense of the spiritual development, and we're going to experience it. We're going to experience it together. Thank you so much. We're going to end now with the serenity prayer, please. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. Wisdom. This is our journey. At the end of this journey, we should all get the certificate. Wisdom people. 